talking to Professor John Norton about his new book to be published shortly, in January 2012 to be precise. It's entitled From Gutenberg to Zuckerberg and the subtitle is What You Really know, Need to Know About the Internet or should that be What You Really Need to Know About the Internet. Anyway John, tell us why you came to write it. Some years ago I wrote The History of the Internet and as a result of that I've had a lot of conversations with people over the years about the network and what it means for our society and so on. And as those conversations went on, I became astonished and uh, perturbed that many of the people with whom I had these conversations appeared to have basic misconceptions about the internet. Um, and after a while I asked myself, um, well, what would people really need to know in order to understand the network and have some kind of rounded idea of its significance for our culture and for our future. Um, and at that point I thought, well, I need to write a book. Uh, and I also concluded that people didn't know, need to know all that much. They needed a few basic ideas. Um, and if you have those ideas, then I think you have a rounded appreciation of, of, of the phenomenon. And that's where the book came from. And what were your ideas? Can you summarise them briefly, those big ideas? I believe there were nine of them, is that correct? Yeah, the, 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 the question was, how many ideas? Hmm. And when I was thinking about that, I remembered a famous uh, paper written by a, a psychologist and published in 1956. And the title of the paper is The Magical Number 7 Plus or Minus 2. Um, and this was, this was based on, on a survey of uh, the literature on psychological experiments and short-term memory. And the conclusion uh, from, from, those, from that survey was that most people can handle um, seven ideas at any one time. Uh, some people can only handle five, and some people can handle nine. And that gave um, the title of the paper, which was The Magical Number 7 Plus or Minus 2. And I thought that's a good place to start. So I came up with the idea of nine ideas. Seven plus or minus two. You didn't manage to get it down to seven, though. It, it, it stuck at nine, did it? The idea, the list of ideas. Well, I, I had to. I had to stick. Having 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 accepted George Miller's idea of the magical number seven plus or minus two, I thought I need to stick at that. Mm. Um, but it, essentially, what it comes down to is that there are five ideas you really need to know, and nine optimally that you should have. Um, and I, my argument is that if you if you if you understand these ideas then you'll be able to have a better appreciation of the internet and also be able to be a critical judge of the public discourse about it. And understand some of the implications and potential qualities of the internet. Hopefully, I yes. Assume. Yeah, mm -hmm. hopefully. Yeah. Mm. Well, the first idea is um, that we need to have some kind of historical perspective on this. We need to take the long view. Um, and that's important because actually people forget that we're very early into this revolution. Um, so the idea was um, to think, has there been before in human history an experiment, such a radical transformation of our, of our um, uh, communications environment? And if so, what were its effects? And we're lucky in that respect because we have done this experiment. We have been through this once before. And we, we went through it with the invention of printing. Um, hence Gutenberg. Hence Gutenberg. And one of the one of the things I, I, I do in the book and I often do in lectures is um, I, I ask my audience to try out a thought experiment. And the thought experiment is this. Uh, imagine that in 1473 they are a Maury pollster, some of you doing public opinion research, uh, in the city of Mainz in Germany where, where Gutenberg operated. And they're standing on the bridge over the Rhine with a clip slate and they're stopping people and saying, excuse me sir, do you mind if I ask you? few questions and question four is uh, on a scale of one to five where one is definitely sure and five is definitely unsure um, do you think the invention of printing will a undermine the authority of the Catholic Church and um, b trigger and fuel the, the Reformation c lead to the rise of, enable the rise of modern science d create entirely new social classes e um, change our conception of childhood on a scale of one to five what do you think and it's an absurd question. The minute you ask the question, you realise how absurd it is, because nobody in Mainz in 1473 had the faintest idea of the importance and the impact that Gutenberg's invention of, of printing by movable type would have. Why did they pick 1473? Because the first Bibles were printed in 1455. So in 1473, the citizens of Mainz were just about the same distance into the print revolution as we now are into the revolution brought about by the web. 
And again, you, the, point, the point of the experiment is, if you ask the question, you realise how absurd it is to have clear ideas about what's going to happen to us and what the impact of this thing is in the long run. Uh, and I think that's one of the most important single ideas you can have about this stuff, which is you have to take a longer view of it, and you can't make judgments just on extrapolating short-term things that have happened just now. I guess things were progressed more quickly than they did once um, the Gutenberg you know, had invented printing. Things took a long time to sort of come into effect, didn't they? Nowadays, it seems to be instant um, activity, well, as yes. the internet's concerned. Yes and no, but, but if you look at the history of, of, of this dissemination of print and how the technology spread through Europe and so on, it was very quick. Mm. It was very quick. People, people you know, when you, when you, when you, if you plot a map, uh, a, a, do a time-lapse map, of, for example, where printers were in Europe in the century after 1455, what you see is something like measles spreading through the continent. It's extraordinary. Mm. Um, now, of course, it was it was slower, and it's 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 faster now. Um, but the phenomenon is the same. It's something that's infectious that's spreading. Big idea number two is the simplest one in the book, which is that the web is not the net. And the reason I put that in is because I was astonished at how many apparently well-informed people thought that the internet and the web were the same thing. Uh, and eventually I concluded that I need some kind of simple metaphor or analogy, and the one I picked was, was um, the railway system. Um, the railway system has two, has two kind of components. First of all, there's the tracks and the signalling, which are the kind of um, the infrastructure for the network. And then on that tracks and signalling, it runs all kinds of different traffic, passenger trains, high-speed trains, slow trains, goods trains, and so on. Well, they, if you transfer that to, the, to, 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 the, to cyberspace, as it were, then the infrastructure, the tracks and the signalling, is the internet. And on the, those tracks and, and that signalling, lots and lots and lots of different kinds of traffic, data traffic, run, of which the web is one thing. But the web is only one thing, and in some cases is not the most important thing that runs on the net. Um, so that's really important to understand. Why? Because uh, it's a, the real importance of, of that is that um, it's a network that matters. So if you focus on a, specific, on a specific type of traffic, which is the web, then you miss what's really significant about the internet. Um, and that was came on to be the, the third idea. But, but the point about, about people confusing the, the web with the net is a bit like um, thinking that the railway system consists only of high-speed trains. Um, you, don't, you don't actually have a really rounded understanding of it. Um, and more importantly, uh, when I, a few months after I finished the draft of the book, uh, I went to a, a Royal Society conference which was organised by with Tim Berners-Lee, who was the, the guy who invented the web. And in conversation with him, I mentioned to him my dismay at finding that um, that many, many important and apparently well-informed people thought the web was the net. And he said, uh, it's even worse than that. He said there are several hundred million people in the world now who probably think that the that Facebook is the net. So that, that led me to think, I've got to make a distinction between those two, and people have to understand that. Mm, okay, well that's obviously a really important thing. And if you could get that message across, if just that message would actually make a big difference, wouldn't it? For many people, that would that would do it. Yeah. Um, and in fact, in, in people who've uh, read drafts of the book, or who have heard me talk about it, many of them, some of them, have actually come up to me afterwards shamefacedly and said, "You know, I didn't know there was a difference between the web and the net." And for them, that was an illumination. It's a very basic misapprehension, mm -hmm. and that led me to the third to the third idea in the book, which was that for the internet, and the internet's the important thing, not the web, the internet's the important thing. Um, disruption is, is what programmers say, a feature, not a bug. In other words, um, people, because one of the things that puzzles people and frightens and alarms people about the internet is how disruptive it is. Uh, every, every time John Humphreys on the Today programme um, wakes up, some, something terrible has happened and it's all to do with the net. The net has, has sprung some other surprise on the world and it's good or it's bad or it's whatever, but it's always happening. And what, what, what lies at the heart of that um, sort of fear is a, mis a misunderstanding. What, what people don't understand is that the, the architecture of the internet, the way it was designed, um, uh, is, 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 was, 
was, was it, its prime effect was to enable disruptive innovation. In other words, it's what the system was actually designed to do, and it's all built into its architecture. Um, so uh, the surprising thing about the net would be if it wasn't disruptive, given the way it was designed. Uh, it was designed to enable what people call permissionless innovation. In other words, you don't need you don't need anybody's permission to do something new. That if you have a good idea and you can do it in software, then the internet will do it for you, no questions asked. Uh, and that's where that, that's that's where it, it turns out to be, in a way, a global machine for springing surprises. And that, in a way, if you wanted a description of the net, you'd say it's a global machine for springing surprises. Um, and then people said, well, what kind of surprises? And I, I give some examples uh, in the book. One of them is uh, the World Wide Web was a surprise because it came from a single man and a small group of people in CERN working on an idea uh, and seeking nobody's permission. And in, in the course of a year, Tim Berners-Lee and a small group of colleagues at, at a particle research laboratory in Switzerland, they invented the World Wide Web. And then without seeking anybody's permission, they launched it on the internet uh, in 1991 and transformed the world. Uh, and, and they required no cooperation, no, no large cooperation. It required nobody's permission other than uh, Tim Berners-Lee, Tim Berners-Lee's immediate boss, Mike Sandel. Um, so you have these these small group of people spring this huge surprise on the world, and the way the reason they can do it is because they can the internet enables it. Second surprise that I talk about in the book is is uh, file sharing. What happened to the music industry? Because again, the story is the same. Uh, Ten years after Tim Berners-Lee, you have a disaffected teenager called Sean Fanning. He's a music lover. He knows there's a lot of music on the net. He knows that it's very hard to find it. And when you find it, it's very hard to exchange it and the rest of it. And he goes to his bedroom. And in six months, he writes Napster, which is the first file sharing system. And it goes from zero to maybe 60 million users in, in a very short period of time. And during that period of time, every single piece of music that's ever been recorded was available for free. Now the problem was that of course it was free. It was it was it was copyrighted stuff, mm -hmm. and and the sharing of it was illicit and so on. And eventually the music industry, which had been taken by surprise by this, managed to get Napster shut down. But by that stage it was too late. The genie was out of the bottle. Mm -hmm. But the point I was trying to get at again is that in this case the net enabled another kind of surprise, and the surprise this time was it was a very very um, depressing one for the music industry. And a third surprise, for example, is, is malicious software, viruses and all that kind of stuff. So the, the, point, the point of the chapter, though, was um, the Internet is a global machine for enabling the springing of surprises. And some of those surprises are good and some of them are bad, but that's what it's about. That's what it was designed to do. A fourth one was that I felt, I felt that we needed um, a better way, a better framework for thinking about what was going on. Um, you can't analyze complex things without intellectual frameworks. And usually in these kinds of, with these kinds of things, the framework we reach for is provided by economics. Um, that's, that's, in the end, that's the intellectual framework we use. Um, my feeling was that in relation to the internet, it was, it was not, it, it had some failings. Um, and what, a prime failing is that economics is the study of how people make, of how allocations are made of scarce resources. And the thing that's really distinctive about the net is not scarcity, it's abundance. So economics is kind of limited in handling a phenomenon like that. And so I looked around for something else and, and the obvious place to look was um, the, the area of study, the field of study, which looks at natural systems. And the one thing that's absolutely certain about natural systems is that there's abundance and diversity and so on. And so what I proposed in that, in, in that, in that chapter was that we should also think about the internet and about um, cyberspace uh, as if it were an ecosystem uh, and if you do that then you have some different insights than you get from just looking at the at economic terms. The fifth of, the big, of yeah. the big ideas is that complexity, this new environment, this new ecosystem that we have um, is immeasurably more complex than, than the information ecosystems that preceded it. Um, so complexity is a new reality, that's, that's what I say. Uh, and that sounds just like a glib phrase, but it has really se serious um, implications. And the, the main reason for that is that complexity is something we don't like. Uh, and whenever possible, we have always tried to either avoid it or to reduce it. Because we can't deal with it. Because we can't handle it. Mm -hmm. uh, and our institutions can't handle it either. 
And there's a there's a famous there's a famous um, law in cybernetics, Ashby's law of requisite variety, which basically says that um, in order to be viable, a system, which could be uh, an organization, it could be a, it could be an ecosystem, has to be has to be able to manage the variety of its environment. Um, in the past, what we have succeeded in doing often is reducing the complexity of the environment, um, in order so that our organizations can cope. Um, the problem we have with the new information ecosystems is that its complexity is so much greater than what went before that the possibility of controlling that complexity doesn't exist. So we have to have some other, we have to have a different approach. We have to think about ways of boosting the sophistication and complexity of our organisations in order to be able to manage it. But that's a massive change. That's a huge change. And, we're, and not only are we nowhere near doing it, but actually, in most cases, we're nowhere near realising that we need to do it. Um, and if you want a good example of that, look at universities. A classic case of, of stable organisations, which, which manage the complexity in the old environment their way, um, by, by forcing students into, into certain modes of behaviour and all the rest of it, uh, by controlling access to, to knowledge, um, by having libraries that people had to use and so on, all that's over. And, and in order to be viable in a new, in a new kind of environment, then organisations like universities have to restructure themselves. They have to rethink themselves uh, in order to manage the complexity or to cope with it. And that's why it's a big deal. These sound like really, really good ideas. How can we persuade people to read your book and take those ideas on board? In the end, um, a book... A book like this works um, mainly by word of mouth. If, be, if people think it's interesting and they, they'll tell their, their friends and neighbours, books s sell or, dis or, or disseminate it often by word of mouth. And it's possible that that might happen. But, but one of the interesting things um, I already know is that um, some months ago I, I published a sketch of the book in, in um, the newspaper that I write for The Observer. Um, what you really need to know about the net and, and so on in two pages or something mm -hmm. um, and there was a very interesting response from the readers because about five to ten percent people said oh doesn't everybody know this um, this is so old hat and, and one, one chap said very one, one chap said very, very amusingly uh, to me anyway he said it, it looks to me like the kind of thing that people talk about when they go to bingo <laughs> now the thing that was the thing that was funny about that so there's there's ten percent ten percent of 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 the response of of the response came that were, were people saying well doesn't everybody know this it's old hat and the rest of it and then when you look closely at it what you find is that most of the people who thought that are people who are technically adept know this stuff backwards and so on and they think it's all old hat and it is all old, old hat there's nothing there's no rocket science in this book at all mm. um, on the other hand there were eighty five to ninety percent of people who said. Wow, that's interesting. I didn't know that. And these and so, are observer readers, so they should, yeah, no, they're, they're, there's a fair chance would, that they might know about it. You'd think that. So pe people are interested in, in the mm -hmm. internet. They are puzzled about it sometimes. Uh, sometimes they are worried about it. Um, sometimes they're intrigued about it. Um, and, and, of course, they're very, very puzzled about what their children think about it and how, why, why are their children so different to them and so on. So I think there's a good deal of latent interest in the subject. And my hope is that the book can surf that wave. Excellent. So anybody who's interested, look out for the publication of this book from Gutenberg to Zuckerberg, what you really need to know about the internet.